We're going to talk about what custom wines are. And uh, custom wines are the same thing as a grape to bottle or a traditional wine. They're, they're, you're contracting with our winery or, or a winery to produce a wine for you. The wine can come from grapes, can come from bulk. It can, it can be something that is that um, that we have or something we want you want to make um, that you want to design. I like to always tell our clients that our that the process can be uh, a very quick one, or it can be a year long process if you're making it from grape. It all depends on what what your desire is. But a custom wine is as significant an endeavor as growing a wine on your own. And I like to impress that upon every client that comes to us is that just because you're putting a label on a wine that you may not have produced yourself, that wine is still important in the marketplace and it has to have meaning. And it has to belong someplace. It has to have a fit on the shelf. It has to fit in your portfolio. And that's when we talk about what the brand promise is. A wine label isn't a brand. The brand is your promise. It's your promise to your consumer that what you're saying on the label is what's in the bottle. It's a representation of who you are. It's a representation of what your winery is. And that's what we like to talk to our clients about before we start putting a bottle or a label on a bottle. By you understanding what your brand is and by you understanding what your brand means to the marketplace, it allows us to produce a wine that is more in line or in sync with what your, your overall marketing message is and what your brand is. Um, we produce some 150 new labels every year and not every one of them has a brand message, which is why we end up re replacing, say, 30 to 40 percent of those in the marketplace for that same, that same uh, retailer or distributor or restaurant, because there wasn't a lot of thought that went into the actual development of that label. Um, I, like to, I like to stop and, and, and think about that for a moment, that we haven't even talked about the wine, and at this point, we, we're already into the process. We're already talking about what's important to your, cu your customer. Your customer wants to know that that brand is going to reflect you, and that's what, this, that's what this is about. So some of the initial decisions that we make. What kind of wine brand is this? Is it a fun brand? Is it a serious brand? Does it have a sense of place? All of these things are taken into account because each one of those decisions that you make in terms of what type of brand you're going to make will help me find the right wine for you. If it's a fun brand, you may not want to be buying Napa Cab for that because it's probably too expensive for the shelf, right? We might be looking at a California tier brand. If it's a sense of place, we want to find a vineyard that can produce for us on an ongoing basis so that your wine actually represents what the brand is. And a serious brand is that, you know, a brand that could have that sense of place, but it doesn't have to be a uh, vineyard designate or an appellated wine. Uh, it could be something that is, say, a Central Coast wine, or it could be a North Coast wine. But it has more meaning than just a fun, whimsical, you know, sub $10 type wine. Beyond that, where does it fit in your portfolio, and where does it fit into the marketplace? Where do you want to price it? Once you've brought to me those type of uh, decisions or those type of responses, I can help you put together a wine. So looking at how we're making decisions, I'm sure that it's, it's pretty apparent to everybody that the, the larger the appellation, the less expensive the wine is, the more abundant choices you have, um, the larger production levels that are available. As you get smaller in an appellation, obviously the more expensive the wine gets, the less, less varieties there are, and probably the smaller amount of production level that's available. When we get into single vineyard wines, they tend to be more expensive. They also tend to be exclusive, and at some, at some points, uh, we may not be able to get the IP or the intellectual property to be allowed to use that vineyard. So these are all things that we consider when we're building a custom wine program for a client. We talk about contracting. In contracting, there's two ways to look at it. You can spot buy. We can go to a, to a broker and I'll call my buddy Steve and say, Steve, I need X, Y, Z in this range. He'll send me some samples and we can find that wine and we can produce it. But it may not be available next year. So that, that's a decision that you have to make as a wine buyer or as a brand owner. How do you want to approach your brand? The other side of that is, is doing the, the, the evergreen contract committing to a grower, committing to a source, saying, 
okay, I'll be there for three years. Can I get better pricing? Can I get access to the vineyard name? Uh, potentially use a winemaker's name? Is there something that's gonna help me to, to position my brand or to give my brand more validity and more, more credibility? By the way, I'm not good at PowerPoint, so my daughter helped me with all the clip art and all this. <laughs> She's incredible, so. Um, I don't even know how to do this, so just, just saying, okay? Did she do okay? All right. <laughs> Thank you. I'll let her know. I'll let her know. Yes. All right. All right. <laughs> All right. So winemaking decisions. So now we've picked the wine, right? And we've, we've decided that we're going to do whatever, the wine, whatever wine we've chosen. You and I have agreed on it. We're ready to produce this. But there's still some winemaking decisions. And in a custom environment, almost every custom crush house, in fact, by the name, custom, will finish a wine the way you want. Maybe add some oak tannins, maybe do some, um, uh, some micro walks, maybe um, find the wine, maybe filter it, depending on what you're looking for. Um, uh, our winemaker in, at our place uh, likes to call it wine magic at that point. They don't want to tell me what they're doing, but they do it. So that's what happens. So those are the decisions that you're making. So you've already made your brand decision. You've already decided how you're going to contract. You've already decided you know, where it's going to come from. And now we're going to talk about the final style of that wine. And now we're going to talk about packaging. So part of Custom Crush also is I, I, you have the option at this point. How would you like your packaging? Do you want a high-end packaging? Do you want a medium packaging? you want a value packaging? Uh, full punt, flat bottom. There's so many choices out there. And all of those are available to you. Again, we talk about the closure. Do you want a cork? Do you want a screw cap? Do you want some alternative packaging? Do you want a can? Do you want Tetra Pak? Whatever it is, those decisions can be made as part of your brand promise. We, we build the label at this point, and we talk about box art. If this is a wine that, like Jeff was talking about with floor stacks and all that, you may want to have a nice pretty box that uh, has great box art on it. Here again, in a custom crush environment, we can produce that. The thing that I look at is before all of this starts, and I put this now only because I've got you sucked in, you know, you're loving this, we're gonna produce this wine, we picked the vineyard, we've got the great packaging. Now I drop the bomb and tell you, get, you can't have it next week. I'm sorry, it's gonna take us some time to produce this. This is a realistic time schedule. For us to develop a label, if you, if you don't already have one, it takes about four to six weeks. Most of that time is related to your approval. For compliance, we go from about a month to four months, depending on what states you want us to, um, to register your brand in. Some states, California can be a couple weeks, don't even have to register there, but uh, Massachusetts could take up to three months. So we, we want to be um, really careful as to what we promise to you and where you can go. Once the label's approved, we do a COLA. That's the Committee on Label Approval, sent to the TTB. And uh, that typically right now is about a 14-day turnaround. Uh, when they were really good about, about a year ago, I could get it in about three to seven days. Right now, just because everybody and their brother is bottling, they're backed up, so we're looking at about two weeks. Once we get that back, we go to label printing. Depending on the contract with the label printing company, it could take three to four weeks to get a label back. Um, in that time frame, we're looking at uh, getting the box art done, and we're getting on the bottling schedule, hoping to coincide with the labels being, being delivered. So all told, it wraps up into this plus or minus three-month time frame uh, to build a custom wine. Um, to me, that sounds like a reasonable amount of time. Uh, to 90% of my customers, that doesn't sound like a reasonable amount of time <laughs> when they first come, and I know that. So we try to go as quickly as we can. We try to, we try to um, avoid some of, the, um, some of the pitfalls, which is why I, I'm sharing my custom wine insights with you. And of course, because sometime you might be one of our clients, I don't want to be insulting, but 80% of delays are caused by the client. We want to get the, pro the product off our desk and in the bottle and gone, but we need your signature on label approval, on glass approval, on cork approval, on capsule approval. We need all of that from you, and it needs to be timely. And if we miss a window on a delivery, then we have to wait longer for that next delivery to happen. Keys, 90% of the, 
of all label errors can be found during the proof check. Take the time to do that. Take the time to actually have them send you a label, look at the label, feel the label, make sure you're checking the appellation, the alcohols, making sure that the names are spelled correctly, making sure that the periods are where they belong, and all that kind of stuff. Take the time to do that. The things that we see is that the, the other 10%, because you would think that 100% could get caught that way, are just physical mistakes that happen during printing. Some of the, 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 the um, embossing could have come off. You know, it might be off center, or the foiling didn't happen, or some colors changed in the, in the printing process, whatever that is. That's maybe a small, small percentage of what happens when we, uh, when we go through it, but there is that chance. I always, always, always say, don't make the wine for yourself. Keep the promise. You have a brand, you picked a beautiful label, you picked the appellation, because it's what your brand represents. Think about what your brand represents and let it live on its own and not what you're gonna, what you want, not, what, not something that's just personal. Another key, and I've, I've been asked this quite a bit, <laughs> heavier bottles cost more to ship. And uh, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent for a little bit more lightweight bottles and alternative packaging. If you're looking for a logo, here's another key. Natural corks, I love them, but they're really hard to print logos and, and messages on. So if you're looking for something creative, agglomerator to smooth corks, always take a logo better. So, and then this is a joke, but uh, foils are for leftovers. So I'm not a fan of foiling labels just because it's expensive. <laughs> so they just say foils for, you're supposed to laugh at that. Come on guys, give me some. <laughs> All right, all right. Now you've got your packaging done, the wine's in the bottle, we're ready to go. We're gonna now send it to a warehouse, but you still have more decisions to make. Depending on how you're distributing or how you're taking this wine, you could go bond to bond, or you take it out, you're not paying taxes, you find a bonded warehouse, wherever you're gonna end up your final warehousing, and therefore the taxes are, waited to, are, are not paid until you ship it out. Some states can't do that, so you have to look for a tax paid warehouse, or that might be all that's available in the area that you're looking. Those decisions could become costly. So I always forewarn, know where you're sending your wine, make sure it's a bonded location or it's a licensed location to house wine. And if it's bonded, you save the taxes until you actually try to sell that wine versus paying it up front. If you're going into distribution, communicate with your, with your distributor regularly. Uh, we find a lot of our clients, they get one big hit and then they send the wine, the big distributor takes it, and they forget to call them for six months because they figure their job's done, the wine is sold. Communicate with us, communicate with the distributors, find out what their needs are, get in there and work a little bit with them uh, to hopefully help your wine pull through. And then know when you're ready to reorder on two fronts. The first front is with me to make sure that I have wine in your pipeline, and the second is with your distributor to make sure they're never out of wine. Then have fun building your brand. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yes, sir. Um, I have a question regarding uh, build, building the brand. Uh huh. Um, is this a brand that you're like giving to them, or is this something that they'll need to get trademarked? Um, is, that, is that something you guys take care of? Great, good how, question. How do, you, how do you guys handle that? We handle it whichever way the client wants. So uh, if you're bringing a brand to us, I recommend you get it trademarked and then you own the brand. If it's a brand that you're developing with us in particular, we can do it one of two ways. We can develop the brand where we'll own it and license it to you. And then after a period of time, if you wanted to buy the brand, we would then sell it to you. Um, we also do control brands. So we, we have several clients that have a regional use of a particular brand, and then in another region, somebody else has that same brand, and then we just make sure they're licensed to not cross over. That's a great question. Great. I must have covered everything. Thank you all. <laughs>